Hi, I'm Ariel. I study computer science at Harvard University with a citation in Mandarin Chinese. I'm from Georgia, but I decided to come to Cambridge for school. In terms of my background, so I do study CS. My interest lies mainly in fintech. I work uh, at places like Goldman Sachs, with equity partners, and I guess on campus I'm involved with the National Society of Black Scientists and Engineers, and I guess that's a bit about me. Can you touch on some experiences you've had as a woman of color in a technical field, both positive and negative? Yeah, of course. So. I think some of the some of the experiences I have are pretty common and trite, if you will. So, people tending to have lower expectations because you come from like a background of, but that's statistically not as involved in tech. Also, having self doubt in general as a person because of the fact that there's not a lot of you in the space. However, those can also be things that are sort of beneficial, if you will, because there's so few of us, the resources and support systems that are actually out there tend to be extremely fortified in the sense of like, there are scholarships to help with teaching you how to code. There are support groups of people that are willing to like mentor and help you along the way. So it, it, it's, it's a double edged sword. As you mentioned, statistically, there are few women and even fewer African-American women in the tech industry. And so we were curious, how did you become interested in computer science? And what's your take on those statistics and how uh, everyone can really work to have more equity in the people who are represented within the tech industry? Right. So the way that I got interested in computer science, it was definitely not overnight. It was a very long process. So I, and at first, when I came to Harvard, I thought I wanted to be pre-med. Mm. I'd done biotech research because it was the only thing that I had been really pre-exposed to as the most successful person in my community was the doctor. And I think that that tends to be the trend for a lot of students that are of like color as well. Like the person that you know that's the most successful tends to be the doctor around you. Came to Harvard and I also took a gap year. And during my gap year, I was teaching myself how to code and I, over time, I started to do more research into technology and how it really is the fibers of our, of our and the inner workings of our world. Like stoplights run on it, the, the roads and the, the, the basic laws and things that we have to pass and like the world is just becoming more and more efficient because it's just running on the fibers of technology. And I felt like I would be remiss not having at least a degree and a basic foundation in these materials, even if I don't wanna be a coder for the rest of my life. I, I feel like that I should at least have the foundations of a computer science degree behind me as I go forward in my future. So I was like, I'm going to get a computer science degree. And so I started working hard and changing to change my major because going from pre-med to this was a lot of work, but I'm glad to say I only have like four classes left and I have a year and a half to finish. So I'm excited in terms of the statistics and whatnot and why maybe that this disparity is. I have like a thesis of my own about this because I work a lot as the treasurer of Nesby here at Harvard, which is essentially where most of the people in STEM and engineering lie that are people of color and black. I, I, I've done several surveys and research uh, to be able to do things with grants. And I've discovered that, like, like I said earlier, most people, because of the facts that historically for, for black communities, the most lucrative job that you could ever be was a doctor because before you being being a calculator didn't make enough money you, you black engineers just were were not a thing back in like the 60s and before and like during like jim crow it just was not even an option being a teacher a nurse and someone in the medical field that served other black people were the most lucrative things you could do and it still tends to trend on on forward like into the community now and it's like literally rooted there um, and so a lot of kids are really just not exposed to the idea that computer scientists and people that do coding and even, even if we don't have like a college degree and you're a coder, you still can make a really, really reasonable living like this. And many people are just not exposed to it. I do think the, the solution to this, though, is kind of a three pronged idea. Mm -hmm. It's rooted in the idea of culture, right? Rooted in the idea of, uh, of like, I guess what I like to call the bubble mentality, which is where when you pair it with culture, it's the reason why people don't go out of it. Like if all you knew was doctor and you're in your bubble together, you will only try to be a doctor and stay in your bubble. And then lastly is like money and, and like resources. So like 
trying to knock out one of these three parts of the trifecta in general is like a really good method to be able to I think I think theoretically would be the best place to start um they're all equally important though so how is the climate interning at Goldman Sachs in New York Goldman Sachs is typically known to be one of the most like it's in an industry that is very just known to be pretty elite, elite and at least a little bit of aggressive so uh, how how did you experience that? Yeah, so when you work at Goldman Sachs, I agree, you always have to be on your A game. Like, I feel like there's not a single day that you are not on your A game, no matter what department you're in. They hold the ideas of high quality, integrity, and like holding holding yourself accountable to, for performing well, like as key. Um, in terms of climate, it really does vary from what team you're in. So some teams are very much more oriented on clients. Some teams are more so oriented on just performing. Some teams are literally because they only have to report back to like non-revenue generating members of the of the firm. What they have in terms of expectations is different. So I'll talk mainly about the, the tech division then at Goldman Sachs, if that's okay. Yeah, like yeah. I did tech and I also did sales and trading because I worked in cryptocurrency this summer. Um, so I ended up being that weird hybrid kid that for like eight weeks, I was literally on the cryptocurrency desk and I, and during the daytime, I, I coded in Python at night, I did like networking, like, like, like a regular s and intern. Mm -hmm. It was a very interesting experience, um, but it's a very rare one. So I think I'll just touch on the one that I think most people will be interested in. Sure. Okay, great. So in terms of Goldman Sachs tech, people tend to normally get in around anywhere from seven, sometimes eight and sometimes nine, depending on your team and leave anywhere from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., depending on, like, uh, the, the Goldman still holds this idea of the of, of hierarchy in terms of, um, how to say, whoever's been there, like, the, the shortest amount of time should probably stay there the longest. Like, but that tends to be a pretty common trend throughout the entire firm. So I would see interns within tech that would stay sometimes until, like, 8 or 9 p.m. at night, but the, the, their counterparts that were maybe first year analyst or second year analyst within the tech division would leave maybe five or six and they would get in at nine. So it's just literally is about the mentality though. Sometimes your boss though will literally be like, oh no, there's no point in staying here. Go on ahead home, I'll see you later. So there's that. In terms of firm culture within the tech division, I feel like it's the, the firm still holds everyone to a certain like degree of, because, because we are, although we're not, they're like not directly client oriented, they are still a part of the Goldman firm. And for, as a unit, like they're, they're still held to a certain standard. So they can dress more casually than their sales and trading or I banking counterparts, but they are still expected to dress somewhat professionally. Like do, we do not expect you to walk in with like tennis shoes. Jeans is not like a thing that you should do every day, but like you can wear like jeans with like maybe a dress shirt. Mm -hmm. Business casual tends to be the standard for the tech division, which I think is very different from other firms. Because Goldman Sachs is a, is a bank first and they're not a tech company, there are just some things that are not going to be the same. So, like, for instance, they don't offer free snacks, which I think sometimes buys people into working at a tech company. <laughs> um, say, say they, uh, they, they, they do have things like bring your kid to work day sometimes. They, they do have volunteer days, though. And uh, they also do have like a gaming area within certain parts of the firm, like certain parts of the firm are like literally there's like a PlayStation set up or like a Wii and it's like literally surrounded by a bunch of like strats and like people that are in tech and Goldman Sachs bought them a big like flat screen TV and they just play it. <laughs> like, so Goldman also has their own language or the proprietary language is normally used within the firm. I know some people are usually interested in knowing about that if they have to, what language they're expected to code in. You will not know the language until you get to the firm. Mm. And it was invented by some people that were originally at the firm, like some original OG strats at Goldman Sachs. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, on to the next question. Have you faced outright discrimination in the workforce or at Harvard and how did you react? Yeah, of course. I feel like whenever you're a minority in um, in a majority space, whether people acknowledge that, that it is a thing or not, like there there is, to a certain point, a reasonable amount of discrimination that whether people, like I said, want to admit it or not, or like are privy to the fact that they're doing it or not, 
I've discovered that generally people don't do it to be malice. It literally comes from a place of ignorance, I think. So I will give an example. So in some places in the world, because, because clients are just not black females or because clients are, are like literally used to working with old white males, when you bring out this 20 year old like computer science kid from Harvard who begins talking to them about their options within different areas and they're used to being to just answering and calling up their their old friend who they like golfing with or like spending time with someone that looks almost just like them like as an old cis white male like the first time they encounter me they do have a lot of prejudice in that and like their mind about is she going to be able to do this like if she is going to be able to do this like why did they pick her why did they why didn't they pick someone else obviously there must be someone else qualified she can't be the only one or like I'm uncomfortable just in general with her existence and like I'm old wow. and I don't have to change so screw you guys like, <laughs> like oh my god and that's just kind of like a how people and clients can be and they're mm-hmm. your clients so what do you do you just you listen to them because they're the ones paying your bills they're the ones signing the check at the end of the day um so I think that there, there there tends to be sometimes a mentality about things like that and that isn't directly usually the company's fault However, there are times when it is the company's fault. So the company n- not making a conscientious effort to like acknowledge and listen to the voices of the minorities in their company is, is a thing that happens. The idea that for those that are like minorities within the company, spending actual time and energy trying to retain them and help them and give them more resources to help bring more people of color into the community or into the company is something that's often also look over like they normally sometimes companies hire whole teams of people that that look nothing like the people they're trying to recruit to recruit kids though Mm -hmm. and i think that's an absolutely absurd thing like don't have like like a random person that doesn't relate to my experience at all try to tell me like hey I want you to work for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I, yeah. I, it just, it does not, it does it not seep in. And because the, the, the number of black applicants in tech is already so small, like, you're going to, you, you need to, it need, you need to step it up. Like, or, or you need to go on ahead and invest early in, in, like I was saying, through, into the cycle, right? Where invest very, very early so that way the bubble of kids will be bigger so you don't have this problem in general in the first place, right? I guess, what suggestions do you have for people not from minority groups to foster a more inclusive workplace or um, school climate or just be more inclusive in general? So I guess the first things first is to not be afraid of them. I know that there, there are actual groups of people that are afraid, that are afraid of black people, like, like I, I, which I thought which is, is absurd, objectively mm-hmm. speaking, but um, yeah, because of the fact that they grew up in like an all white neighborhood or an all like Asian neighborhood and like they literally have not experienced or had like positive experiences with black bodies at all. Like they will go into work in their life just never talking to you ever, even if you sit right next to them for a whole summer. <laughs> wow. um, so and, and, it, and it's, it's from a place of ignorance once again, but dealing like spending time grappling with the fact that 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 is that their blackness is just is not like your problem and could even be something that you could grow to enjoy especially if they're in in the same literally workspace as you so there's no way that that that, that they're like that 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 they are really coming out to get you or to cause any type of general harm <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, so that's one thing is acknowledging that and dealing with that. Number two is listening to like the narrative. We talk about this a lot, especially within spaces that are struggling to retain um, black bodies within like certain departments, like listening to the narratives of why students are leaving, listening to the narratives about how students are brought up and how it's different from other students that are succeeding, right? Listening to the narratives is extremely important. Because no, no two people are the same. Point number three, just being kind in general. Even if you feel like you will never be able to get along with this person as well, like they're just too different, yada, 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 yada. The least that you could do is practice humanity and kindness. And there are a lot of people that still don't, still don't do that. And I think that it's important, like universally, but especially when someone's extremely different from you. 
just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing all of your experiences and um, the takeaways that you've had because at least for us I mean we're from Los Angeles we go to school in San Francisco and we don't really leave California that much and California is a very liberal place where people are generally accepting of people that are different than them but I mean you're from Georgia you go to school on the East Coast you worked in New York that's just so different and I appreciate having that perspective shared because that's something that even us who are open-minded young people don't really get to experience that often so thank you yes thank you I love you guys tech ones for life (laughs) thank you hard work and humanity are the keys to success mic drop (laughs) 